Eight. Oh, I'm so excited to be here today to talk about social-emotional learning. Uh, I know that, let's see if I can get this to advance. Cass, my, uh, there we go. I really am, I'm really excited. I'm jumping for joy to be here to talk about social-emotional learning. Uh, and I know the only thing standing or jumping between me and your, your lunch is this presentation. So I'm going to make it interesting. You won't know. The 250 slides will go by so fast. <laughs> Okay, how about the sessions you've heard this morning? Anything that you can take away and use in your classroom on Monday? Don't feel like you have to do it tomorrow, but uh, Monday will be good. Hope you, hope you take something away today that um, sticks in your brain and fills your heart. Well, you know this probably already, that today is Laugh and Get Rich Day. Yeah, <laughs> see how exciting it is already? Um, I, I use the, these types of calendar events in my classrooms to bring about joy. We have a lot of stress. There's a lot of things to be upset about. So I think when we can celebrate, it's great. So I ask students to share celebrations with me. Um, you can Google days of the year and get to these calendars. There's all kinds. Um, there's 30 days to celebrate chocolate, right, alone. So if it were a chocolate day, I'd be passing out chocolate. Now, just because it's get rich doesn't mean I'm gonna pass any money out. So you might wanna stop by and pick up a lottery ticket for that. But this is a great way to uh, engage your students in a fun way. It takes just a few seconds. Okay, so three things I want to talk about today. I want to talk about social-emotional learning, some of the research behind it. Um, we're going to touch on that because we're talking about research to practice. I'm also going to talk about your well-being. We talk about the students all the time, right? I'm going to talk about your well-being and some things that you can do. And then finally, uh, I'm going to give you some tools that you can use uh, yourself, with yourself, uh, uh, with, with other adults, and also tools that you can use with your students, most importantly. Okay, so what is SEL? Have you heard of SEL, social emotional learning, hands out there anywhere? Oh good, that's great. Anybody practice it in their classrooms? Yay! Uh, we all probably could share a few things with me then. So let's talk about it. Um, I was going to do a poll everywhere, but since we've loaded um, this off of my computer and it's up in the, the booth up there, I can't do the poll everywhere. So if you would, just turn to your neighbor and tell them one thing you know about social-emotional learning. Get to know your neighbor if you don't already. Wow, thank you very much. Either you're talking about what you're having for lunch, and that's exciting you, or you know a lot about social-emotional learning. Hopefully I can give you uh, some tools that you don't already have in your toolbox that you can use. So what is social-emotional learning? This is a big, long definition, and we're going to break it down, but it's from CASEL, um, the organization that is um, globally known for um, uh, social emotional learning for K through 12. So let's break it down here. So it's a process for both children and adults, right? Where they learn uh, and acquire, they acquire and effectively apply several things, knowledge, attitudes, and skills. And one of the main things they use it for is, there we go, understanding and managing emotions. I'm going to talk a lot about that today in a, a particular part of my, my section because I believe it's key to many of the areas. Also in setting and achieving uh, goals, positive goals that we're looking at, feeling and showing empathy. Um, I was at a high school yesterday um, with a panel of students. It was a school that had uh, middle school and high school students. I think she was one of the high school students. And she's, we, I said, what, what do you really need? What, what is something you really need here at school that makes you successful? And she said, I need my teacher to show me empathy. And she named it. She already knew that. So she's on a, on, on a, on a roll. Also, establish relationships. So establish them and keep them as well. And then make responsible decisions. Some of our students have a challenge with that, don't they? Uh, that executive function is not, not fully developed. So let's look, oops, sorry, went too fast. Let's look at another definition. I like this one by Justin, who's an author. He talks specifically about emotional intelligence. 
That's a big buzzword right now. It's huge in business. But he says emotional intelligence is the ability to make emotions work for you instead of against you. And that's what we want to do. Um, there's no such thing as good or bad emotions. It's just comfortable and uncomfortable emotions. So we can make them work for you. For example, before I came up on stage, I was a little nervous, a little fearful, like, was I going to say something stupid? Was I going to trip? Then they told me I didn't have a, a computer up here, so I couldn't see my slides. Um, so I was a little nervous, but I thought, wait a minute, why am I here? So I just owned that, that, that uh, fear for a minute, and I thought, I'm here to help teachers. I'm here to give you something that you can take away. So if y'all get one thing today, and you take away, and you use it, and it helps students, that's all, that's all I need, okay? There's a little lag between clicking and it getting there, so sorry about that. This is not a new idea. Social emotional learning has been around for a long time by many, many names. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it, it got its impetus from, from the special ed education. Character Counts um, is a program, I think that's the one that I had when I was teaching fifth grade. Um, and we embedded it into the school day. Right? It was a program we actually used. Many names, soft skills, it gets called a lot. It's called soft skills, too, in, in the business world sometimes as well. Castle, that organization I talked about, um, has this great model for us. And they have set up these competencies. And you see them, the color in the center there. Um, and I'm, we're going to break those down just a little bit here for you. So self-awareness. First is being able to aware, be aware of your own uh, feelings and emotions and behaviors. Right, to name those, and then to manage them. So being able to regulate your emotions, um, and uh, then we move to awareness. So perceptions of others, others' point of view, how they feel. Relation skills, building and maintaining relationships is another one. And then finally, decision making. Do we do things that keep us safe, right, and they're healthy for us, uh, and does it fit the social norms? So this particular model is used by many, um, many of the programs, that SEL programs that are used in schools. It's a very common model, and you'll see it when you're looking at social-emotional learning. Um, any type of curricula, it's, it's usually embedded in there. Okay, let's talk about the research, a little bit of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss two uh, meta-analyses uh, about social-emotional learning in schools. So the first one is um, from Durlach, and he did a meta-analysis with 213 different schools, uh, almost uh, 300,000 students. So he had a, a, pretty, a pretty large number there. And what he found out was links to social-emotional did some great things. They learned the skills. There was an increase in actually learning the skills in those competencies. Their academic achievement went up. By teaching social and emotional learning to students, their academic achievement went up. Okay? Um, also, positive attitudes increased, and finally, pro-social behavior. You know, that's like caring and sharing and that sort of thing. Some things went down, though, which is great. Conduct problems went down, right? Uh, aggressive behavior, emotional distress. Any of your students have some of these? Yeah, okay. So by teaching this, we decrease this. There was an, another meta-analysis, which is a little more recent. Durlax was in 2011. This is 2017, Durlax and his... Uh, or Taylor and his um, colleagues. Um, this time, there was about 100,000 students in 82 schools. The difference between these two studies was this one uh, did a follow-up study. So it followed students into young adolescence and early adulthood, which you'll see is key in a minute. Again, social-emotional skills went up. Students actually learned those skills and were embedding those skills. 13% achievement. The achievement increased even more, and they were just better adjusted. Now, here's what went down. Fewer dropouts, and fewer had been arrested. As I said, it followed them into early adulthood, so there were fewer arrests for those students who had been in these social-emotional programs. So, the research shows that it works. Mathematicians out there, you like really big numbers, right? So, I, I had to put one up there for you. I, I googled um, EQ, uh, and that's the number of hits I got. So adults are interested in this. Um, they know they need it. It's, it's, a, it's a great topic because uh, they know that it, it works once you learn to manage uh, your emotions. So let's talk about your well-being uh, and how I can help with that. I don't know that I can help with that. What do you think these two have in common? <laughs> Somebody say stress. OK, 1,000 points for every one of you. That's great. Yeah, it is. The research shows that classrooms are a stress-inducing 
as ERs, right? We know that. <laughs> We're in them. Um, so what I want you to do is think about the slide changing. Oh, then it finally changes. I want you to put your own oxygen mask on, right, before you put them on the children. The bag may not be inflating, but the oxygen is still flowing, right? Put it on anywhere all the time. Take care of yourself is what I'm saying. One way you can do that is with mindfulness. That's kind of a buzzword right now, too, mindfulness. You hear it all over. Um, so we're going to practice a little mindfulness in a minute. I'm going to show you how easy it is and quick to do. Um, but it's just knowing, and it doesn't mean you're sitting cross-legged with, you know, your fingers and your, hmm, you know, that's not what we're talking about. It's just being aware of your surroundings. And we're going to take a little quiz in a minute over emoji cons, so I'm getting you primed here. So it's, it's presence of mine, not present of mine. Uh, and we're going to see this from John Zabot Zinn's uh, video, if I can make it play. We'll see. Uh-oh, I think I hit the button. <laughs> when I bent over, I'm so sorry. We'll try that again. I'll put this down. If you don't know anything at all about meditation, what it really is, is it's about paying attention in a systematic way. And for, a, uh, for no reason other than to be awake. Because a lot of the time, if you pay attention to where your mind is at, it's not in the present moment. It's off someplace else. Either in the future or in the past, you know all this. We spend huge amounts of time worrying and, and uh, planning and then being upset about what happened or what didn't happen in the present moment, which is the only time we have to create or to be in relationship or to love or to do anything, it gets kind of squeezed. And so we're blasting through our present moments to get hopefully to better moments at some point, whether it's the weekend or vacation in the Bahamas or whatever it is where it'll all fall together. And then, of course, it doesn't because it rains and the kids are cranky or sick or you can't go or whatever it is. So the conditions are never actually right for being in the present moment which is why we don't want to be there so much. I mean, if they were just great, then of course we'd all just be here all the time. But since it's never really satisfactory, we drive ourselves insane, really, trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic, as opposed to sort of understanding that we're not the Titanic to begin with. And so anyway, that calligraphy was the calligraphy for mindfulness. And I just want to say that uh, in Chinese, uh, various uh, ideograms are made up of other ideograms in the character for mindfulness is made up of the ideogram for presence, that's the top one, like a little hat, over the character for heart. So when you hear the word mindfulness, you have to understand it as presence of heart. I like to think it's a presence of heart as in a box of presents, right? It's a little gift you're giving your heart when you can take time for mindfulness. Okay, so let's talk about, oops, there we go. Um, one of the places you can get information about mindfulness, is anybody familiar with the Greater Good uh, Science from uh, Berkeley? It's research they do on gratefulness and mindfulness and well-being. A great place that you can get information um, on mindfulness, lots of articles and activities that you can do. Good for you and for your students as well. Um, this is a very popular topic. Has anybody do, has done a on, free online course, some of those MOOCs they have out there on great anything from coding to oh, you name it? Two of the most popular last year out of the top ten were on mindfulness. So people are in search of this. They're looking for it. Why practice it? Why should we do mindfulness? There's some great reasons here. First is that it keeps you well. It helps you stay well. Um, it also boosts your positive emotions and decreases your negative emotions. There's not really positive and negative emotions. We tend to think that way. Like joy, we think is positive. Anger, we think is negative. There's just, there's just comfortable and uncomfortable emotions. But it helps us, I guess, with more, more joy. Oops, wrong way. Um, also helps us in learning. Mindfulness helps you learn. Uh, helps that density of the gray matter. 
It also uh, helps us tune out distractions. I don't know about y'all, but a few distractions in the classroom, yeah, all the time. So if we can tune them out, that's great. Enhance relationships, whether it's a relationship you're in or you're looking for a new one, you might start mindfulness, you know, to get a jump on that. Um, and teachers who have been trained in mindfulness have lower blood pressure, less distress. They're actually just more effective teachers, is what the research shows. And it helps you manage difficult students, which we're gonna talk about. Um, but before we do, before we really get into mindfulness, um, I want to talk for a minute about the dog mind and the lion mind. So the dog mind is like this. If I have this, this is a bone. Actually, I made soup with it uh, last night, but it's a bone today. If I have this bone and I'm waving it in front of the dog and I throw it, what does the dog do? He chases it, right? Yeah, unless you're mine. He's really lazy. He won't do it. Okay, so he chases the bone. What about the lion? So I'm sitting in front of the lion. I wave this bone around. What, what does the lion do? He's probably going to eat me, right? But here's the deal. He has options. He may lay down, stretch out. He may wander over to the bone and smell it. He may go chase a gazelle. I don't know, do they eat gazelles? Whatever, you know, some other animal. So he sees the big picture. He's not focused on the bone. The bone is reality for the dog. And we're going to think about bones, and you can think about your own bones and what you get focused on and you miss the bigger picture. Um, so that's the key behind that. Uh, and it'll make sense as we go along if it doesn't already. So we're going to try an exercise here. And um, this is from uh, Patricia Jennings. She does a lot on that Greater Good website, but she's written books and, and other things about mindfulness. So um, what I want you to do, and you have to play along, uh, I want you to... Um, if you're not a classroom teacher, you can think about a person in your life. But I want you to all close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to think about a difficult student you have. You know, that third period or right after lunch. That, you know, get this picture of the student in your mind. Now I want you to recall the last time he or she did something that uh, prevented you from teaching or made it difficult. What emotions come up for you? How do you feel? Are you tense? Is your neck tense? Are you sick to your stomach? Do you get a little nauseous, nervous? So don't try to stop these feelings. Right? We're not stopping this emotion. We're naming it. I feel, and you fill in the blank. How do you feel right now? OK, you can open your eyes. Everybody picture someone? Can somebody shout out, we were going to do another poll everywhere, but the technology is not working uh, with the booth again. So um, can you just shout out, how did you feel when, when you were thinking of the student? Frustrated. Sad. Yeah. Anything else? Pissed off. Pissed. That's too, that too, right? Yeah, they can push your button. They know it. Um, these are very common emotions. Every time I've done this exercise with students, um, or with people, I'm sorry, with, with uh, audience, they have those same emotions. Some really get nervous, sick in their stomach, they feel that pit, they're like, oh, it's third period, oh, it's third period. Well, here's what's cool. So I've been teaching this to my graduate students. I work with teachers who are getting their master's degree. So I'm teaching them these strategies, um, sort of using them as guinea pigs, they don't know this, but then they go out and they try it. So I had taught it one week and uh, had class the next week, and two different uh, teachers came to me and said, oh, you know the mindfulness thing? I tried it. It was the best class I've ever had in my life. Um, it was just total different because what happens is we name that emotion, and then we can start thinking cognitively instead of from an emotional standpoint. So I encourage every one of you to try this uh, at least once and see how it works. Oh, there we go. Um, here's another way, because you're like, well, that's all good and great, but between first and second, I'm going to do mindfulness, between second and third, and third and 24, the lunch time before school, right, get a little overwhelmed. Uh, well, let's figure out a way we can do it during class. Uh, how many, let me ask you a question. This is going to be a math problem, get ready. Uh, how many questions uh, do you ask every period, do you think? Average? 50? 60? God. Okay, I must be a really lousy teacher. I'm going to say three, because I can do the math on this one. Uh, three. Say I have five classes. Three times five is 15. That's 15 times built in that I could do some mindfulness. If it's 60, wow, you, you have a real advantage. So what do we do after we ask the question? Wait time. 
three to five seconds, right? We all know this. Research has shown us that waiting that time allows them to cognitively think about the answer. So let's build uh, some, some mindfulness time in it. So here's what you do. You ask your great question that you have planned, right? And you're going to take a deep breath. Preferably you don't close your eyes at this point, but you're going to take a deep breath. As soon as you ask the question, remember it's five seconds. You're supposed to be waiting, so breathe in, breathe out. You're going to feel your feet firmly planted on the ground. That's step two. And then you're going to broaden your awareness to the whole class. You want a lion mind here, right? I want to see the whole class. I don't want the bone. I don't want that one thing I'm focused on. Right? So I, the whole class. And then, as I look out, I'm going to find a student that I haven't picked on recently. Right? And I'm going to ask them to answer it. And I think this might be the hardest part. At least it is for me. Because I may be thinking about my next question, or what we're going to do after this, or, wh or who I'm going to call on if he didn't give me the right answer, those sorts of things. You have to listen to what they say. Granted, sometimes it's not what we want to hear, but you have to listen to what they say. You have to be in that moment with that student. This is all about six, six seconds, not six minutes, six, six seconds. So you could do this multiple times a day uh, when you ask questions. Is that something that would work? Yeah, it would. It does. Um, so let's talk about some um, other tools uh, that you might use with your students. Uh, and we're going to deal with emotions. So some people wear emotions on their sleeves. Like, you know what they're feeling all the time, sometimes too much, right? Some people hide it really well. Some students hide it really well, and we don't know what's going on. But as Cassandra said in the beginning, um, what I had said was that emotions matter. Feelings matter. They really matter. Uh, because if we're an emotional standpoint, if we're coming from an emotional place, it's very hard to learn. And if your students are emotional upset, it's hard for them to learn. Even if things are perfect, Algebra brings about a lot of emotions for kiddos. I'm not sure about that joy over there, but um, there, there probably are some. But curiosity, excitement, frustration, all of these could be going on. And they could be going on for one student, you know, multiple emotions. But if it's fear, that's a real challenge because that's one of those extreme emotions that shut them down, right? They have that fight or flight. Um, so, we ha students have to understand about their own emotions so that they can be able to, to think cognitively. Okay, anybody had a whole conversation with emojis? Okay, you're laughing. I don't see hands, but yeah, I know you have. I have. No words, just emojis. So, so we, already, we don't need emotional intelligence. We have it right on our phone, okay? So, um, we're going to have a little quiz here. So, see how you do. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to flash something up, and, emojis, and you see if you can figure out the phrase. Feel free to yell it out if you want to, or yell it to your neighbor. Here we go. Oh, y'all are good. Head in the clouds. You're acing it. See if you can get this one. I stumped you. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Ah, uh, you all failed. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tutoring uh, Monday after school. Okay, so anybody seen the movie Inside Out? Oh, isn't it so awesome? I have a quick little clip here because it deals with the next tool that I'm going to show you. So I'm, we're going to run through this real quick if I can make it play nicely. When I can't. There we go. They're helping me out up in the booth. Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Make it safe. What is it? Uh, okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yes! Well, I just saved our lives. Mm. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not going to get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fake. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Riley, ah! Hey, here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh. Airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Isn't that great? If you haven't seen the movie, the whole movie's great. But that was a little toddler there. There, uh, This happens to students all the time. They go through multiple emotions in one period. Yeah, uh, particularly middle, middle, middle schoolers for some reason. Well, here are the emotions that Inside Out just... Um, Clicker's not working. There we go. Um, here are the emotions that uh, they just showed in the movie Inside Out. Um, these five emotions, and we're going to look at something different, a different model in a minute, but here are the five emotions that um, the movie talks about. So, uh, the reason we're talking about emotions, and I don't know if anybody's read any of Dan Siegel's work, but he talks about naming it detainment. He's kind of coined that phrase, I think. He's a psychologist who, um, from Harvard who is now, he's an award-winning educator, and he is a, a neurobiologist at UCLA Medical, I believe. Um, so we want to be able to name our emotions. Here's a tool you can use. This is great for you and probably your older students. Um, it's called the Atlas of Emotions. And the cool thing is it's based on the same emotion. By the way, the Dalai Lama was part of this to, to create it. It's based on the same emotions that the movie Inside Out did. Right? It's got those five emotions and the colors even match. So uh, we're not live. I just did some screenshots of this and I'm going to show you. So say I'm angry. And I go and I click on it, and the next slide would come up. What emotion are you feeling right now? <laughs> Frustration, right here. It's what we're going to talk about. So the really cool thing about this is there's this scale. So you could be just mildly annoyed all the way up to fury, right? So you, can, you have more labels on the emotion instead of just anger. And then I'm frustrated because my slide, I keep clicking this and it won't work, right? That's the definition of frustration. You keep trying it and trying it and trying it, it doesn't work. So think of your students when they're trying a new, uh, some new content in, in math and they're trying it over and over and it's not working. Sure, they're frustrated. Well, label that. Say, I know you must feel frustrated. Help them, help, help them understand what it is. And then the next slide. Okay, so say we selected frustration it tells us possible responses that we might have had. So you can say, oh, yeah, well, I'm just going to simmer about it. <laughs> I saw this gentleman put his hands up like that, so I thought maybe he was frustrated and simmering too. Um, and then it gives us a, a definition. It tells us this is, can be a destructive. If it's ongoing, it can be destructive. Um, and we can express it by sulking. My daughter was great at that. I just remember now that, uh, yeah, she was a sulker. But then it tells us things we can do. Uh, with frustration. This is some antidotes. So uh, letting go or putting things in larger perspective. So um, say that, uh, say, say you're teaching geometry a couple weeks into school and you have a student that's really frustrated. I can't get it, I can't get it, I'm stupid, I can't get it. And she's going on and on and so you set to talk with her and you say, but last year in algebra you told me you made an A, right? How are you doing in English? Oh, you just wrote an essay and you did B plus on that? That's great. So right now, geometry is her bone. She's not seeing anything outside that. She's just, you know, a dog after a bone. You hear that term, right? So help her see the broader and get out of just, you know, focusing on the bone. There's also some videos on there. Anybody a Harry Potter fan? Yeah. Who's not a Harry Potter fan? That'd be easier to answer. Um, Here's a quote that says, um, just because the, you got the emotional range of a teaspoon doesn't mean that we all have. Well, as it turns out, it's probably closer to true. Um, instead of five emotions, the uh, uh, neurocenter out of Glasgow uh, University says there's really four. God, it's getting easier all the time, isn't it now? There's four. Um, because disgust and anger have very similar facial expressions and some of the similar ranges of emotion, crinkled nose, you know, squinting eyes, that sort of thing. So now you only have to teach your students four emotions. How easy does that get? You guys aced the quiz, so I'm sure you can tell which four emotions they are. Did you guess? Happy, sad, angry, and afraid, or scared? Yeah. So let's look at each one of those real quick. And this is something that you could actually use and teach your students. You know, emotion of the week, emotion of the day, whatever you want to do. But um, there it is again. Really, there's no good or bad feelings, only comfortable and uncomfortable feelings. Uh, those naturally happy people. Anybody know one of those persons that are always happy and the rest of us just fake it? Huh? I'm one of the happy ones, by the way. 
sad, <laughs> you didn't get something you want. Boy, that happens with students all the time. Yeah, but it happens to us too, right? You don't get what you want, your, your dream you think is shattered, something like that. Anger. Anger is, uh, you know, the Titanic did not end well. Anger could be in the same situation. With, with anger, it's, there's a lot underneath that emotion that you have to help students figure out why they're angry. I mean, if you've had teenagers your own self, you know, sometimes they're just angry and you ha that, there's just no explanation for it, right? We didn't dig deep enough down in that iceberg to figure it out. And then afraid, right? You know, if you perceive um, a loss uh, or a threat, you know, you're going to be afraid of something. If you perceive it's going to be harmful, if I'm going to try that algebra problem and I don't get it and they're going to make fun of me or, you know, so a lot of that goes on. Okay, oops. And we're gonna, there's this quick little video about what happens when these emotions go on in the brain. What happens to our body. I'm going to start it from up there. When we hear the word emotion, most of us think of love, hate, happiness, or fear. Those strong feelings we experience throughout life. Our emotions are the driving force behind many of our behaviors, helpful and unhelpful. Just where do our emotions come from? Our brain is wired to look for threats or rewards. If one is detected, the feeling region of the brain alerts us through the release of chemical messages. Emotions are the effect of these chemical messages traveling from our brain through the body. When our brain detects a potential threat, our brain releases the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol, which prepare us for a fight or flight response. When we detect or experience something rewarding, such as someone doing something nice for you, our brain releases dopamine, oxytocin, or serotonin. These are the chemicals that make us feel good and motivate us to continue on the task or behavior. In these instances, the feeling region of the brain kicks in before the thinking part, Sometimes the reactions of the feeling brain are so strong that it dominates our behaviors and we're unable to think rationally in the moment. Our emotions hijack our brain. While many of our emotional responses happen subconsciously, our thinking can influence our emotions and sometimes this can be unhelpful. Just thinking about something threatening can trigger an emotional response. This is where we can manage our emotions with conscious thinking. Our emotions play a powerful role in the way we experience the world. Understanding and regulating our emotions through our thoughts and behaviors can help us take greater control of our brain and achieve our goals. Okay. All right, so we're going to do a little hands-on, pun intended here. Uh, we're going to do a brain model. Uh, you may have seen this before. This is also from Dan Siegel, uh, who said, name it to tame it. Um, so take your hand and put it up like this. I can see you out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this part of your arm, that is your spine, right? That's your spine. And right up here at the top is your brain stem. You know, this is the back of your neck. That's your brain stem. This meaty part right here is the hippocampus. That meaty part of your thumb, that's your hippocampus. Learning goes on there. Long-term memory is stored there. You really want the hippocampus engaged when the kids are in your class, right? You want them to activate that, that part of the brain. Now take your thumb and fold it over, and your thumbnail is the amygdala. The amygdala is where emotion happens. That's our emotional uh, area. Notice how close the thumb and the, the, the amygdala and the hippocampus are? Um, they are connected. If we learn something, we have emotion uh, tied to it, we remember it forever. Um, for example, 9-11. Can you tell me where you were, what you're wearing, who you're with? What, you, can, you can detail those. So when emotional things happen, good or bad, and we tie it to, to memory, it's in there. Okay, now take your uh, fingers and fold it over. Okay, and that's the prefrontal cortex. Okay, prefrontal cortex. Uh, all the executive functioning goes on in there. Now, what happens if uh, you're driving down the street and, or driving down the highway and you're cruising along and somebody cuts you off and whips in front of you? You're probably going to do this. Probably going to flip your lid. <laughs> or is that just me? Uh, yeah. So 
anger comes up, probably fury in some cases, because we know road rage, right? Somebody goes from zero to fury just because they were accidentally cut off. So we call this deregulation. When a student is deregulated, this is important, when a student's deregulated, they can't learn. You probably, can, you probably know of instances. You have a student that comes in that's really ticked off, ticked off at you or something that happened before they got there. Any learning going on? Absolutely none. So you've got to regulate them. Or not, you don't regulate them. You have to help them regulate themselves so that they can get back to learning. Okay, so um, Dan, uh, Dan Siegel also talks about the upstairs and downstairs brain. So if we're in the downstairs brain, emotion's happening. We act and then think. What we need to do is get to the upstairs brain so that we think and then act. So that's, that's key. So I, hopefully I coined this. I don't know. I haven't heard it before. But regulation station is what I call it. And there's some things here for all grade levels, okay, kindergarten on up. The Momentous Institute is a, a, a school here that I just visited not too long ago. What they have are what's called these uh, calm down baskets. And there's things in there that are tactile very squishy things, things to play with, manipulate. Um, and it's, no, you're, it's not that you're misbehaving, you're, you get to go play somewhere. It's that you're deregulated, and I need you to get regulated so you can come back and join the rest of the class. Um, they, um, also, you have emotional vocabulary cards that you could use. They could be learning about their emotions or trying to name which, which one they had. Uh, they might even be using that atlas uh, of emotions as well. Um, did you all download the mood meter? Oh, it's such a cool, we're going to look at it in just a second. Uh, might have a poster up there. I got these uh, Where's Waldo uh, calendars. By the way, I'm going to give one away today. Um, and what I did was cut it apart. And you know how you search for Waldo? You know what this is? You search for him in the picture. Uh, very difficult. Uh, but when you're doing that, you're regulating yourself. Everything's slowing back down. Um, if you Yoga poses. I was at a, a school yesterday, a high school. I was Pinkston, as a matter of fact, high school. And they have yoga classes. How cool is that? Um, and then there's also breathing exercises, and let me grab my little tool here. Y'all get to play along with me and breathe. I think this is called a Hoberman sphere. Okay, so here's the way it works. When I open it up, you're going to breathe in. Don't stop. And then when I close it, we're going to breathe out together. You ready? Pretty easy. Okay, here we go. Let's do that one more time. The goal on breathing, I've learned, is you're supposed to breathe out slower than you breathe in. It's hard because I'm usually out of air by the time I get, you know, get to the top anyway. So I have one of these I'm going to give away today as well um, for you. So breathing exercises. That same student that I was seeing yesterday when we were talking about social-emotional learning, and I asked her what would help, you know, if she were deregulated. I didn't use that word, but if she were upset, she said to have a place to go calm down. I remember telling students to go get a drink of water. Walk. What do you do? Count to ten? Y'all probably have some strategies that you use yourself already, right? We always heard that. Count to ten before you react. Um, so having a regulation station or some regulation tools for your, your uh, students is great. Here's another one. God, anger seems to be kind of an issue today. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, but something like this. So they know what it looks like and what they might do. Here's another one. Maybe. Um, I think on the back of your handout, actually, we copied uh, something like this. How are you feeling today? Remember, it matters. It really matters how your students feel so that they can learn. And so there's a sample for you of that. So that they can meet these needs, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need. Here are the vocabulary cards I was talking about. What's cool about these? The definition is right on the card, right? It's a visual vocabulary card. Somebody's going to walk away with a set of these. I think there's 165 of them. Uh, I use them many ways. Uh, I have put them out and just ask students to look and pick up one that, that expresses how they're feeling. Sometimes we talk about it, sometimes we don't. They just put it on their desk, and I know what's going on. I usually have to pick up two or three. I can never do just one. But, you know, maybe they are feeling uh, sleepy and um, powerful at the same time. I don't know. Uh, but you can quickly figure out how your students are feeling. Younger kids, you can use this model where they can say, oh, I'm angry, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write about it. And that is a good thing to have older students do, too. They can journal and write about their, their feelings and emotions that are coming up uh, as well. Have you seen these sociograms? 
This is really, really, really cool. Um, you can do one yourself for your class, and you can also ask your students to create one, um, their own little sociogram. And what's interesting about this, look at Sam up here. Who pays attention to Sam? Nobody. Same thing's happening. There was another one over here, I thought. I don't see where it went, but yeah. Um, these three girls over in the corner, they're, they're together, right? They've got it going back and forth. So if the arrow is just going one way, there's a problem, right? The students aren't learning to fit in um, socially with groups, and we want them to be able to manage those relationships. Of course, of course we can use books, right? Um, these uh, picture books are fabulous, and there's tons of them. These are not the only ones. Uh, it's just some that I've, I've used before. They even come in Spanish, too. And now you're thinking, well, I don't have time to do this. I already do X, Y, Z, plus teach. And then after lunch, I do X, Y, Z, and teach some more. And, okay, you're thinking you don't have time for it. It's not an either or. You don't teach or teach social emotional learning. Students need both, right? And they need it uh, embedded. So older um, students can, can use books like this. By the way, Bird Seed, not to be confused with Bird Box. Uh, <laughs> I just bought this book. Fantastic. It's great. It's got 30 exercises in it that take less than 30 minutes. And you can even squeeze it down to less than that and have students sort of write outside of class about it. It's a great tool, but there's several of them that you could use. Anybody seen this website, happyfy.com? Oh, I love it. It's got some great things. Do not pay for anything on this website. I, I hope happyfy.com is not listening. D don't, you don't need to pay for anything. There's free services on here. Um, and one of them is the power of positivity. So this is um, balloons, and you simply click on the air balloon, the hot air balloon when it's coming down if it's a positive word. And if you accidentally collect on a negative word, you lose points. Um, so it's just a, for about a minute, you just watch these balloons float by. It's very, very calming. Here's another one that's calming as well. Oh, besides, when you go in, you get to talk about how you're feeling, so it keeps the score for you. I'm going up, by the way. You see that? I'm getting more positive. That's great. I thought I was at 100, so I'm really disappointed. I'm not frustrated yet, though. Um, okay, so maybe you're having a hectic day, and you need a few minutes just to get mindful with yourself, not about students, but just center for a minute and, and uh, center on, on your own self. There's several scenes that you have here. This one uh, is a lake, and you can hear the water kind of lapping at the shore. Birds are chirping. You can do it for, for a minute by yourself, or there's a, a guided meditation if you wish. So that's a great tool as well. Some students might like that. Here's the mood meter. Have you had a chance to use it yet? No? Okay, we'll say you're happy after this session, though, okay? Um, so here it is. It goes from high to low and pleasant to unpleasant in these quadrants. And you just go and pick out how you're feeling. It gives you all of these, these uh, different names for, for your uh, emotions. And so, so you click on it. And I'm focused. I clicked on that. I get to say why I'm focused, right? Because I'm passionate about this or, um, yeah, I'm passionate about this topic. When you click on it, then you either get to stay there or move. So if you're in an area you're not really happy with right now, that, that that's not where you want to be, you get a chance to move to another area. It also uh, tells you where you spend most of your time, right? So you can look at it and say, wow, I'm usually in that upper, upper uh, right quadrant where I'm, my, I'm a lot of energy and I'm happy. Sometimes I'm calm, not so much energy. It gives me a list of all the words I've used, all the emotions, and if I said anything about them. Uh, and Drucker, I don't know if you've heard of Peter Drucker, he's an educator and a, a management consultant. He says, you know, if we, if we measure it, then we can manage it. So that's why that tool helps with that. Say I'm frustrated and I want to move, and I want to move down to, to the uh, calm area. This pops up, gives me a quote, uh, it gives me um, strategies I can use, it gives me some of the past reasons that I was calm whole bunch of strategies there. And I can go in and put my own strategy. I'm like, I don't like any of these. What I really like to do is, and so you can add your own. You're thinking, yeah, this is great, but I can't use it with my students. We didn't let them have the phones out, and they'd be playing and texting and whatever. So you can make a poster of it. It doesn't have to be technology. Um, if you have a student who comes in, and they're in this upper quadrant right here, we got a problem. That's fury, right? That's, that's, we've got to get them to regulate. You know that they need to regulate. Um, so this is one where the students just just plotted, right? 
great math tool for you there. You can go old school and just have colors and then know what the colors are and not specifically for your younger kids as well. I use things like this, conversation starters. So instead of having vocabulary, I might just have pictures. Pick up one of these postcards that shows how you're feeling, right? And, and they do that as well, or with the buttons, same idea. So um, I, I want you to use your power for good and not evil. You know, how you manage your emotions affect your students, right? So uh, we gotta check ourselves first, right? Uh, I, I'm guilty of, of not being, doing so well with that myself. So um, use your powers for good. And what we're going to do now is we're going to watch two quick videos. I'm going to do just portions of the videos because they're a little bit longer. Um, and uh, administrators challenge their campus to do this, to go out and, and tell students something. And I think you'll, you'll get it when I, when I play it. Mr. Braden mm -hmm. asked the teachers to pick a student. Mm -hmm. You know, that's important to them. Mm -hmm. Blake, you make me want to come to work every day. And that's the reason I chose you. Because you are important to me. I wanted to share with you that when I come to work, I look forward to seeing you because of your genuine heart. I've had you for two years and you've always cared more about others than you have yourself. And when you ask about my mom and my husband and my family, it makes me feel really good because you care about me as well. And Blake, that's the reason I picked you to film this morning. That's the reason I picked you because you are important to me. Thank you. You are welcome. So Mr. Braden's doing a project where he wanted me to videotape one student that inspires me to come to school every day. And I chose you because I love having you in class. Mm, thank you. <laughs> He's a little shocked. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Braden has okay. asked for all the teachers to do a special project. I'm gonna stop there and show you a high school version of that so that we, you know, equity. I'm trying to get it all in here. Um, but just think about what, how powerful that this is for those students that hear that from teachers, right? A lot of learning going on there. Here's the high school one. So I'm doing a positive Oak Park project, and you're one of the students I selected, and I wanted to let you know that you inspire me to my, be a better teacher, and you make me want to come to school every day. <laughs> and I think you're awesome, so keep up Thanks. the good work. Thank you. inspired by to come to work every day for it. And it is you because of your work ethic and your incredible drive to continually be successful every single day. Your attitude and your work ethic and you inspire me to come to work every day as a teacher and you need to keep up with doing because you're awesome. Are you serious? Yep. Thank you. Yep, inspires me to come to work every day. You can see the joy uh, in, in these students when they hear that. Many of them are shocked. They're not used to hearing things like that, especially from their teachers. Not to say that you guys don't say that, but you can just tell the ones here just shocked to, to be recognized that way. Um, and speaking of recognition, um, I have, everybody's gonna receive one of these. I went into a middle school uh, last semester and uh, the, the morale was, was down in the school for, for a number of reasons, but um, that's irrelevant. It was just the morale between the teachers and you could just tell the staff, it just was, it was not great. I walked into the women's restroom and saw one of these signs. And the next time I went in there was another sign and another sign. I thought, wow, what a great way to stop chasing the bone, right? Let's put it in perspective. So we're gonna, there's some people that are gonna pass these out to you. Thank you so much for your help. And on the back, three of them have gold stars. 
And I have gifts for those people if you'd like to come up and pick that up afterwards. And I'll just leave you with this, that I hope you found three things today that you can take away and use with your students or your teachers or your husband, I mean, whoever, whoever the case may be. If I can do anything for you, if you have questions, if you want more resources, something I shared and didn't really go into detail, feel free to email me. I'd love to connect with, if you do something at works that I talked about, I'd love to hear that too. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope you have a great rest of your conference.